Hi, this is Reg Atwal and welcome to our channel. Welcome back uh, for another one of our episodes. And today we're focused on our show, Family Business Experts, where I get a chance to interview another expert or entrepreneur that can give us some insights, some ideas, a bit of wisdom that can help us either at a family level, business level, or ideally both. And today I've got a very, very dear friend of mine who's on the show and I want to give him a formal introduction. And there's a few things that you can glance at while I'm doing that on the screen. So uh, our guest, special guest is Rohit Talwa. He is the founder and CEO of Fast Future, which is a group of companies involved in supporting his brand and others with keynote speaking, a consulting company, and more importantly, a fast growth publishing business right now. And uh, Rohit is a global futurist. He's one of the best in the world. He's award-winning speaker a strategic advisor, an entrepreneur focused on really delivering future insights, provoking radical thinking, and enhancing the prospects for humanity. He works with global companies, entrepreneurs, investors, governments to help them anticipate and respond to the forces and ideas shaping the future. He's worked with big brands, I'll name a few, American Express, EMAR, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, PwC, Shell and Tata, just to name a few. He's also worked with governments directly with the United Arab Emirates. He's worked with the Singapore government and in the UK and US. And he's authored and edited with his team seven books. I find that absolutely incredible. I think there's probably at least two uh, books coming out every year right now. And it's a pleasure to have an exclusive inter interview with him today because in the last one week, he's just published the new book from Fast Future, you can see it there on the screen, the big cover there, which is Aftershocks and Opportunity Scenarios for a Post-Pandemic Future, which was published on the 1st of June. And this is his first formal interview on the book. Okay, and apart from that, the book is full of 28 chapters, which is bringing together ideas from 25 future thinkers from around the world. So on that note, right, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for asking me to be here. Yeah, I really, I'm really glad that you, you, you're joining me because you've had a really busy, what do we call it, a marathon, a publish-on, a speaker-thon, I don't know what you call it these days. All of the above, all yeah. of the above. It's been, you've been, it's you've been at it for what, 12 hours back-to-back -back, uh, promoting the new book, uh, and congratulations. And no, it was a lot of fun. We decided that the best way of promoting the book and hitting every time zone was to go for 12 hours from 10 a.m. in the UK to 10 p.m., where we had 22 of the contributors talking for a few minutes and discussing the ideas in their book. And we had some people who actually stayed with us for the whole 12 hours and others Brilliant. came in and out. It was great. It was really what, cool. So with the book, uh, the new book, and then I really want to talk about some of the other books you've also published and your research. Um, you know, what, what is the big, biggest shock? <laughs> you know, you talk about shock, aftershock. What is the biggest aftershock for humanity, for businesses? What's your thoughts around that? Well, I think given your audience who are entrepreneurs, family businesses, wealth creators, the real aftershock for them is how much of an opportunity that a downturn creates. And particularly when you add a medical crisis to an economic crisis and the supply chain crisis we've had, that is like a, a real golden opportunity to say, well, we could be building some of the next hundred billion or trillion dollar in businesses in the world in the next five to 10 years, because there's so much opportunity. And as we outline in the book, there are so many opportunity areas, so many things changing and so many countries where they realize that they can't rely on global supply chains because mm. they get shut down in a pandemic. So we're going to have to build up everything locally from farming to manufacturing could, you, could to we get into some of those things then wrote could you give us like a top five where do you see the biggest opportunities where businesses should be thinking about integration with some of these or maybe it's a new venture opportunity you know what could some of those be right so let's take the first one healthcare um yeah. all around the world there's been a shortage personal protective equipment uh that is something that everyone has locally they have the capacity to produce clothing, to manufacture, you know, plastic screens for people's faces or face masks, all of that. So it's very easy to move your, your domestic manufacturing of, of jeans or shirts or dresses to something like this, or to add facilities that you can turn on quickly and to negotiate contracts with governments to say, 
we'll reduce your reliance on global supply chains because we'll manufacture locally. And all around the world, you see governments signing these deals now. And it's smaller entrepreneurs who are getting most of them because they're the ones who can get in fast, demonstrate quickly they can do it, and, and deliver to quality and on time. The second area is around food. Everyone needs to eat. The disruption of global fly, uh, supply chains caused havoc in the supermarkets. It meant a lot of people didn't get fresh food and, and it caused chaos and it drove prices up, none of which you want. Yeah. But actually, but what we now have is the ability through vertical farming and container-based farming to grow anything you want in the back of a truck, in a big shipping container, or in a massive you know, warehouse right in the middle of town. Mm. And the technologies are getting cheaper. You can do this anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter about the climate. You, know, uh, you control the climate technologically, mm -hmm. and they produce 30, 40, 60 times more food wow. than if you just flout, farm the square acreage you sell. Are, so, are these like internal, like I've seen some documentaries on these, but essentially, your own internal labs, you know, they're, they're all, they're, is that what they are? Internal well, greenhouses, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, I mean, so you've got some where they've taken 10,000 square feet of warehouse space and you've got these multi-story, you know, 30 tray high uh, growing trays of food and they're, they're fed hydroponically, so water is dripped yeah. into them. They're, they're monitored continuously. They're given the perfect amount of nutrient. So there's almost no waste. You can grow any crop from anywhere in the world in this, and you can be growing bananas in one place, <laughs> and you know next to them strawberries, and next to them yams. You know you you're you're not constrained by the soil conditions, by the atmosphere. You can grow what you want. So you could you know you could cure hunger. You could guarantee local supply. It becomes much cheaper over time. Mm -hmm. But now people are putting these in the back of shipping containers and into um, trucks mm. so that you, if you're a restaurant, can just have a truck outside where you grow all the veg you want. So you could literally say as a chef, you know, this next season, here are my recipes. So let me make sure we're growing the ingredients I want for that. You completely eliminate your reliance on anyone else. So we've done health, we've done food. The next is about any kind of consumer goods. The footprint of manufacturing is coming down now with, with robots. You can buy robots now at $1,000 or $1,200, which you can program to do any task. So right. instead of right. buying a $50,000 industrial robot, you buy one of these for $1,200. You put four of them in and you can have a local facility manufacturing right. anything right. from... How much was the one behind you on your left there? It looks quite... The, the, these two, these are like $20 each. These are both <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> But they they come in pairs because otherwise you get lonely. Uh, yeah, but um, you see you see you see a lot more robotics being used absolutely. everywhere. Yeah, so you're talking in manufacturing. What about uh, in businesses, corp corporate offices, homes? Do you see robotic uh, technology being used there? Well, you know, we've all got nervous. Uh, we're all worried about humans talking to us. So we got these kind of home delivery services now where. They drop the food outside, they knock on your door and run away. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but now you've got robots doing this all around the world now. Oh, they run away. <laughs> they don't run away. The robot stays there. You know, it literally come, drives along the street, delivers your food to you. We've got drone deliveries happening now. The technology is moving at speed. Mm. And, and you've got home care robots looking after elderly people, doing the washing, doing the cleaning. I think we're seeing a robotics revolution. You go to airports now. The robots are screening you, they're cleaning the airport, they're doing everything. Mm -hmm. So th th that's the third thing is robotics. The fourth is uh, people always thought that artificial intelligence was something for big businesses and was a few years away. Mm -hmm. Now there's something called ro a robotic process automation, which is just really smart automation of your business processes. You've got someone in finance who's taking information from one system, putting it into another, mm -hmm you know, doing five or six different tasks across different systems. Now they can train the software to do that task for them. Mm. And they're freed up to do other tasks. Or if you're in an environment where a lot of your staff got laid off or because they were ill or, you know, mm. couldn't come to work or you, now we're in a situation where you can carry on doing business mm. using these technologies. So is that like an extension of like the old days I don't know how long now, what, 15 years, 20 years ago, when that the original outsourcing model, uh, you know, with the Accentures of the world uh, and people outsourcing to India, then you had business process 
uh, you know, engineering. So, you know, with thousands of people in, in, in an open plan office. So now you're saying you're taking those similar things, but now it's automated using algorithms and other stuff where you don't even need those 1000 people in an open plan office. Yeah, no, you take our business. So we have a business manager. The orders come in for books on the system. They come in on one system. Uh, they're fired off. She has to check that they've gone off to the warehouse to distribute them. She then has to enter those in a certain way into our accounting system and then generate some stuff there, produce some reports. She's now going to train this software to do all those tasks for her. But she's got like 20 times more tasks to do in a week than, than she has time for because we're always adding new things. So she can teach the software how to do the tasks that she doesn't want to do which I just think is brilliant. Now, this is taking it away from some tech head in the back office, trying to work out how you do your job to you saying, here's how I do my job. I want the software to do it for me. And then, uh, so we've done back office automation, you know, robotic process automation with healthcare, localized. Uh, and then I think that one of the gate, uh, localized manufacturing, localized food. Mm -hmm. And then the one that I think could be um, really quite, interesting yeah is resilience like resilience. Every, yeah everyone is saying oh my god we got shocked by this we had no idea how to do this whether we were government or whether we were a company we just were totally shocked by this we weren't prepared we didn't know how to move our people to work from home we didn't know how to get the right equipment to the right places you know everything was a shock in some countries you know i live in the uk we're still behaving like this thing just started yesterday you know, we're still making it up as we go along. And actually, every country has realized that you can do this a lot better. Mm. And the companies and the countries that got their act together mm. had tiny infection rates, tiny death rates. They're out of it now. Taiwan, Hong Kong, New Zealand. Uh, and the same companies. The companies who were able to move their staff quickly mm -hmm. and get them working online using technologies like this, just, you know, doing business normally within a day or two, they weren't disrupted. The ones who were taking weeks and months to sort it all out really suffered. So I think there's going to be a lot of business service opportunities around helping local businesses and local governments develop those resilience capabilities. And now people have seen the cost of being unprepared. They'll be willing to pay for that advice and those solutions and right. backup systems. And that's everything from... You know, how do we socially distance staff in the workplace to how do I back up my, my data so that it's accessible from a thousand staff working at home mm. and the system doesn't fall over all the time. So there's incredible opportunities come out of this. Incredible. Um, and I think, you know, given the environment that you serve, I think some of those businesses are going to be first to pick these up and run with them. Can I ask you, Rohit, I mean, obviously, you know, we're going to encourage people to say, hey, look, go, go buy the book and we'll make sure all the details are in the description below. Go, go and Google Fast Future and you'll see the details come up to go through all of these things in detail. But for today, you know, we're just getting some of the insights from you. One of the things I'd like to ask you, Rohit, and this has come up literally in the last 24 hours where I've got a client of mine, uh, you know, chairman of a very large family business, said, I, I want to reevaluate my vision 2030 right okay there's already a vision in place for up to 2025 for all the businesses uh i'm hopefully going to catch up on a call in a couple of days time but i wanted to get your thoughts as a futurist as a global thinker with all the research you've done if you're if you're in a room with someone you're building out a vision 2030 with existing businesses that are involved in manufacturing trading distribution and so on you know old school type businesses not in tech, you know, none of those things. What, what, what's your view? What, what are some of the things to look out for and think about? So I think the first thing is, you know, the leader and the leaders know themselves. They know how they like to operate. Do they like to be the innovators, like the first to do something? Or do they like to come in quickly when they see something is happening? Or do they like to wait till it's like a really proven market and then scale it up for So, you know, you, you're one of those three. Most businesses are one of those three. So you, the first thing is your vision has to be close to, to who you are and how you are. Yeah, so once cool. you've got that, then you start to break it down into three chunks. You say, okay, uh, 
what is the stuff that we need to do in the next couple of years to really fix whatever we feel didn't work quite, quite so well in the, in this period? You know, what, where did we, where were we a bit slow or where were we slow to take advantage of opportunities? And that's normally around skills. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's around how do we get our back office technology working and our core systems. So we're not wasting a lot of time with people running around with paper. They, it drives leaders mad. They ask for something and everyone then runs around for three days to try and give them the information because it's not easy and accessible. So the, the first is training of your own people, really training people to a level way beyond you think they need so that they're flexible enough to, to respond to anything. The second is, you know, get, some, get a real focus on getting your tech sorted and making sure your people understand the tech. And the third and probably most important is having really deep conversations with your customers, right? Who are your main customers in your main business areas? What are they saying about the future? What are they seeing coming? How do they see themselves evolving? But this is, where, this is where you come in as well. Obviously the work we do with, with our company, but you as a consultant as well, where sometimes people can't do that on their own, can they, Roy? They don't even know what questions to ask. They don't know how to facilitate that conversation with their own team or their customers. They're lost. So you, I mean, people like yourselves, ourselves can help them. We can facilitate those conversations to show them how to ask good questions. But a lot of this, you don't need, the consulting help I think is really about giving people the courage to go out and do this and, and helping them join the dots and make sense of what they're learning. But I think the most powerful learning comes when they're watching the videos of what's changing online. They're then having a conversation with a customer saying, hey, you know, you're a retailer, a food retailer. We're in the food business. What do you think about this vertical farming thing? Have you seen it? And suddenly they're the expert because the food retailer hasn't thought about it. But that puts them in a really interesting converse, quite a position because they're hearing how their customers are seeing the future. And the reason to do that now is it starts to help identify, well, what should we be researching now that we might be bringing to market in, in two to five years time? Mm. And, and then for that longer term piece, that longer term piece is really about being very adaptable, having a good basic kind of skill set in your organization that you can turn people to anything and having that ability to scan the horizon for what's next, which is both researching and talking to customers and and i think it's those mechanisms that it doesn't matter what you're doing whether you're building trucks whether you think that in five years time you might want use one of these tiny factories to produce two and a half thousand 3d printed cars it's being alert it's having the conversations and, and getting the timing right i think my guess is that this business you're talking about the thing that they've been good at is having the right kind of nose for when the you know when the timing's right and, and that is about having lots of conversations. So, so really it's about building an organization that's capable of having lots of conversations where all your staff are also sensing what's going on. So whether it's someone operating a machine, feeding back in, look, my kids are now playing this game or, or you know, my husband is now working in this business and they're doing things differently or you know, we're thinking of doing this to our home. All those are signals of how the market's changing. And so it's, it's becoming really good at listening to the signals from your own workforce because they're bringing so much rich information in. So a lot of the shift in terms of becoming a company that's capable of really mapping a powerful path to the future is about becoming a company that's really good at listening. Some really good advice there, right? I appreciate that. And, and when it comes to the, the, a macro view, looking at you know, a global view, what, what are the other things that you see happening over the next five, 10 15 years that we need to consider. And these, some of these things I know that you've, you've uh, talked about in your, in your other books. Uh, you know, so what, what, do, what do you see happening with, you know, with, with politics, governments, power plays, uh, uh, currencies, oil, you know, tech, manufacturing, dominance in different parts of the world? There's a whole bunch of things there. What's your view on how all that comes together in one big story? Let's break them down into things. I mean, politics is the complex one. Politics has been turned on its head by Trump and his, his unwillingness to accept the order as it was, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the UN or the agencies like the World Health Organization or World Bank, IMF, NATO, uh, China's role in the world. He's tried to challenge everything. 
And, and that's caused instability. And some of that's gonna be good because it's gonna allow for new things to emerge out of the turbulence. Some of it is unhealthy, like trade wars, no one ever wins. But I think, I think you have to look at the long-term plays here. And for me, looking at China is really instructive. You know, so China's 50 year plan. Mm -hmm. They're building this one belt, you know, this Belt and Road Initiative, you name the number of countries, anywhere between 70 and 160 countries in there, anywhere between 30 and $150 billion going into it, depending on how you look at it. But trying to create infrastructure, services, manufacturing in this new Silk Road, so there's a lot of activity going to be going on there. China's going to have huge political influence, particularly in Africa. It's going to control a lot of the key technologies. It's putting 430 billion into AI to be the world leader in AI. So that is going to give them a lot of global power. Right. And it's how others react to that. So I think the, the tension is going to be about the world's relationship with China and who's China's allies are. And I think for a lot of businesses, the, the key will be about keeping really alert to what's going on both in the short term, but also the bigger picture. I think a lot of companies are going to get out of manufacturing on a global footprint because of this. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to start to see is instead of supply chains, we're going to see innovation chains. So I could be a big manufacturer based in the U S but instead of manufacturing in 50 countries and having to deal with everything, I'm going to sell my intellectual property to partners in every country. And that's where I think, again, medium-sized businesses, 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 sorry? Can that's jump. an interesting model. I like that, yeah. They're going to become the partners to this. And things like manufacturing, vaccines and medicines, everyone's going to need that locally. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. And oil, do you see the, the need for oil reducing over time? Like more and more renewable energy, new ways of, uh, you know... Uh, yes, but on a longer time frame than most people think. I, I think it's going to take maybe 30 plus or minus five years for us to really wean ourselves off oil. But I think you will see a lot of industries trying to, to do use more alternatives. Mm. And I think there'll be a general shift towards just being more sustainable. And part of that is driven by uh, the kind of assets of the sovereign wealth funds, who've been very comfortable investing in bonds mm. and in listed equities, or, you know, throwing their money into Uber or whatever, you know, into big bets that aren't that you know outlandish yes. but now they're all getting impact investing they're all saying how do we invest in the future and sustainability so they're all looking at the sustainable development goals and thinking about how do we invest so that's going to create a whole wave of money to invest in these green new deal technologies green new production technologies green new energy technologies home building techniques so there'll be a massive growth in that Mm. And that will shift things away from oil-based products anyway. Uh, in terms of the economy, we're going to go through four or five, in the next 10 years, we're going to go through four or five you know, of these as we readjust. Why, you know, why do you say that? Why do you say four or five, uh, what do you call because, that, waves? <laughs> yeah, because uh, right now, you know, people think we're going to come back up again. Mm. But there are so many fragilities in the global economy that I think will dip down again. Because what's happened is uh, about a third of people around the world haven't had their incomes affected at all. So they're going to go out and buy and you see them shopping well. But that's reflected in businesses. So a lot of businesses you see are setting targets based on this kind of, you know, rocket takeoff of the economy in terms of the revenues. But you look at their spending plans and they're basing it on a downturn. So if everyone is planning to spend less, what happens? You know, it rolls through the economy. And there's, there's, not, this, enough, there's not enough flow, is there, for, yeah. for everyone? Yeah. And so you'll see this. And I think, you know, it'll just be very hard. And eventually, governments around the world will realise that we have to get together and we have to do things to stabilise the weakest and poorest nations. You know, whilst there's a risk in countries of, it, of the virus going off the charts, the whole world is at risk. So we need to build up their health infrastructure, their civil infrastructure, their economic infrastructure, and their local entrepreneurial infrastructure. And until we get that right, we're going to have a lot of volatility. And we have to fix things like debt. That, that's just pushing a lot of countries to the brink. We're probably going to have to wipe out poorer nation debt. You know, there's a lot of big shifts going to come. Mm. Markets are going to go crazy while this happens. So countries are going to go in and out of recession. 
Mm. Countries like the UK, US will probably spend as much time in a downturn as in an upturn in the next 10 years. Because also you've got things like technology, you know, artificial intelligence, these disruptive technologies coming along, making massive shifts. A lot of people get made redundant, but then suddenly the economy booms again when you see all the new possibilities they create. Mm. We've got so many new fields of science and technology that are going to create, you know, 100 billion to trillion dollar industries within the next 10 years. Mm. So it's going to be really disruptive. And that creates huge, huge opportunities, again, for mm. entrepreneurs and those willing to, you know, read the, the tea leaves, you know, read where the signs are and start to go, let me get into this space yeah. and this space. You can't be in everything. But, you know, the, the overall picture for the next 10 years is a big shift. 10 years time will be a greener world. Mm. I think we'll have much more sustainable industries uh, because we'll have gone through a lot of the change. We we'll now know what the new model of the economy looks like. We'll probably have more stable global politics. Mm. We'll have a new world order. The old institutions will have changed, but it will be a rocky 10 years. Yeah. And you, you've got to learn to be flexible, adaptive. And, and that's why training is so important to make sure our people are sensing and able to react to what's coming. And can that's good, right? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a lot there. And uh, I think, I think I like, how you frame it that there's opportunities okay so you're not looking at it negatively but at the same time row there's many businesses that make okay they may not be the the big conglomerates that have reserves you know and, and cash there to sustain themselves but there's lots of businesses that uh, you know have a lot of debt they have a lot of outflow commitments the inflow like you said is not happening so what happens to them um you know is this going to be a year where you know, the, it's going to be the death of many businesses. What do you think? Or, and what tips would you give someone so they can survive or revive themselves in order to then look at those opportunities? Because you've got to breathe first. Some people are like, wow, I, I want to innovate. I want to go and try some new things, but I need to breathe first. You know, they, they're, they're caught. They're stuck. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the thing is that uh, the pandemic didn't think about those things when it started. It didn't think about what would the impact be governments didn't really think about well how many businesses will get pushed over the edge when we lock everything down and you know it it's just happened and i think the, the the grim inevitability of this is that a lot of businesses will go bust you know i walk down the high street near me and i look at some of those shops and i go you're not coming back right or i talk to friends and in their business i hear what they're doing and they're saying you know we're making a culture what we used to yeah and I can't see them coming back. The, the, this is where good management comes in now. This is where you have to decide where you're gonna cut your losses. Mm. You know, are you gonna keep pouring money into something that is never quite gonna make it? Mm. If you've got debt, obviously in some countries you can't just walk away from your debt, you know, you have to deal with it. But it's really about renegotiating terms with your creditors. It is about finding ways to give you that breathing space getting out of big premises into smaller ones. If you're a retailer, do you need a retail outlet anymore? Or can you go and do pop-up stores at markets? Can you sell more online? It, it is trying to find ways of, you know, adapting your business to the world we're in and, and renegotiating, renegotiating with everyone, your suppliers, whoever, canceling whatever contracts you can. It, it's good housekeeping. But some are still going to go bust and the, the key is acting fast on those because the stress doesn't help you yeah. and the stress doesn't actually drive you forward. Yeah, I agree. Then, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, also, and also maybe to add, you know, when, when the markets were good, the, the market can also be forgiven, you know, and, but when you end up in a crisis situation, now, now you see the real truth of, of whether the, the company had a good business model or a good product or a service, where there is a need for it. So it's a good shakeup. Um, we all know even prior to any crisis, businesses still fail even without a crisis, you know. And some of the biggest businesses were born in, in recessions, right? You know, that's always the case. And people make fortunes in downturns. So even if, you know, some economies are going to shrink by 30% this year, right? that is unheard of. But that still means 70% of the economy is going to be there. Mm. And it's about looking for, well, where do I go? 
you know, where is the money? Where can I do things that are still going to make money for me? Yeah. And, but the interesting thing I think is that you can already tell who are the businesses that can adapt because they're doing it now. Yeah. They're not waiting till it's over. And culturally, but, maybe they were already set up that way before. Yeah. Uh, maybe not. Like restaurants who've never had uh, done takeaway. Yes. You know, they've gone through three stages. So they've gone through the shock. <laughs> then they started to create takeaway only options. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they've taken themselves online. And now some of them are saying, well, you know what? I can't reopen under social distancing rules. Mm. Can I, I can only have a third of my customers and I can't make money on that. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is grow my delivery business. And they're getting out of their high street premises. They're moving to smaller units in like warehouses and industrial states. Mm -hmm. And they're partnering with other chefs, other restaurants, and they're creating, you know, like they're called ghost kitchens where they make the food, but it, you never get to eat there. They just supply it to homes, to functions and all that. So they're already adapting. People who used to get luxury, luxury well, how, how about this one, Roy? This morning we had a delivery, we had an Amazon delivery. And for the first time, uh, we, we, my wife said, oh, get, you never guess who's delivering uh, the Amazon box. I'm like, who? She goes, the local taxi company in Dubai. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So now you've got a giant like Amazon that is using the local taxis, not Uber, not the creams, the local Dubai taxi for delivery. Which is brilliant. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. People just going, what can I do to, to tap into it? Because the thing that's grown massively in the lockdown is home delivery, whether it's buying from Amazon or anyone else. So there's an opportunity there to become that delivery infrastructure if you're a taxi firm. Even if you weren't a taxi firm, you know, maybe I was a manufacturer and I had my own trucks. Well, now I'm not manufacturing. Why don't I repurpose my trucks to be doing deliveries for other people, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's where you've just got to be flexible in your mind to say, where is the money right now? Where is the money going to be in the next 12 months? What are those things that are important? Well, let, let's get into some other areas then. What's your, what's your predictions around the education industry? Okay. Colleges, schools, universities, uh, professional educational firms. What, what's your thought? Where's that going, that whole industry? So before the downturn, everyone was getting really excited about electronic education. They're doing it all by your tablet, your laptop, your screen. Mm. During the, the pandemic lockdown, we realized that there are some limitations to that. That A, people go crazy looking at the screen all day long. Uh, you can do some really clever things. You can do some things that you can't do in the classroom. But we're realizing that we need that blended learning model. So I think there's going to be a lot of innovation around new learning designs. You've already seen it happening in places like Singapore, where they've dropped out of the league tables because they're too restrictive. Okay. And they're saying, no... We're now moving from seeing our kids as like economic units of production that you have to kind of equip with certain capabilities to whole people who have to be able to navigate their own way to the future. So we've got to equip them with many more skills. So you're going to see classrooms changing, taking out desks, more use of technology, but blending time outside with time inside. A lot more of what's called flip learning. So you watch the video at home of the lecture, you do you know, work at home, and then when you come into class, it's much more of a conversation with the teacher about what you've learned to make sure you've learned it and help you deal with problems. The, the other thing I think that's massive is that we're realizing that people have stopped learning as they get older, and we need to really accelerate learning of older people, 30s, 40s, 50s, so they can retrain for new jobs. And I think we're going to see schools, colleges, universities being flipped now. So they become much more of a resource for the community, you know, being used all day long for people to come in where someone from a, you know, a vertical farming company comes in and teaches people how to work in a vertical farming company in a high school from six till nine in the evening mm. so that they're training their next generation of class of staff in that class might be school teachers. There might be people who are firefighters, there might be lawyers, there might be bank clerks, airline staff who are retraining to go into some new field. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Oh, I like that. I like that. that that's, Repurposing uh, our facilities. Yeah. You've got me going there with my head. I can see many opportunities there. Okay, so can I ask you, leading on from that, Rohit, I know you talk about this in one of your books and also with your regular newsletter that you send out. 
to everyone. And for those of you, again, go, go to the description level and the details are there. Make sure you get Rohit's uh, monthly newsletters. And could you go into some of the, you made some predictions. I don't know whether, maybe it was last year or the year before, but you, I think you had this article about the top 200 future jobs, new new jobs that are going to be created. Could you Could you tell us about some of those jobs and maybe some of them becoming reality this year um, on, on, on the, especially for the next generation, you know, what, what areas should they go down, which will be uh, positions in, in high demand in high need in the future. Um, so rather the, than traditional, I will become a banker or an accountant or a doctor. I, so a lot more of the jobs of the future are those that can move between professions. So like data scientists, someone who can look at data and draw insights from it, use different tools and algorithms to say, okay, this is how people buy from us. This is when they buy. You know, this happens in the outside world. We get a peak in demand. So, you know, there's a football match on. Yeah. Suddenly we sell a lot more sandwiches or whatever. Yeah. And, and using those insights to help develop products and marketing campaigns. And that's useful in every business. So data scientists is one. Uh, we're, we're all using social media a lot more, online entertainment a lot more. So you're seeing a lot more of these roles that are like curators who are trying to guide you and I on what we should be watching or you know listening to. And then uh, one of the downsides of kind of modern life is that people um, are a bit more stressed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've seen a massive growth in online therapy, all sorts of different ways of helping people de-stress, gain balance, find their center and come back again. And I think that's going to be a a massive growth area because there'll be a lot of people who won't go back outside anymore. They're going to need some coaching, some therapy to kind of build their confidence enough to get out and go back to a workplace. So what, what would be the top three skills for the next generation? I know they link in with some of the things you're saying outside of, yeah, you know, I've got to, I've got to do my English. I've got to do my maths. I've got to yeah. do geography, uh, whatever social sciences, what, you know, what, when it comes to skills, what should a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 18-year-old be thinking about right now and go, okay, uh, Mr. Rohit Talwa, I get it. I'm going to start learning that immediately. I'm not going to wait until I'm you know, in, in my late adulthood. Uh, well, one is learning how to learn, learning different techniques for learning. So you've got a range of different ways of taking on information from video to being in a classroom to reading and, and accelerated learning. So really investing time in finding what are the best ways for us to learn stuff because we're going to need to be learning all the time the second is problem solving that if you know how to use a range of different approaches to solve a problem you become like uh the 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 go-to person in an organization mm. because you can stand back when everyone else is going crazy yeah. and you can say okay let's structure the problem let's work out what we want as an outcome then what are the steps to get there? And, and, you know, how do we hear everyone's voice? But you're the person staying calm and guiding them through because you've got 20 different methods for doing that. Third is collaboration. We're in a world now where everyone believes they're right. No one wants to give up the ideas that they had. Uh, everyone thinks that they have to win more than someone else. Or, you know, I mean, these are generalizations. But being able to collaborate, being a, you know, from being taught in school how to share toys, to how to work as a business with three other partners to tackle a marketplace. Learning how to collaborate, learning how to create win-win, I think is so critical. So those three are really important. To me. Collaboration, problem solving, and, and learning how to learn uh, are, are what will give people transferable skills to create new jobs of their own or to move from job to job with other people. Love it, love it. So just, just pulling it back to where we started with your new book uh, that you've just published, any other insights you'd like to share on, on you know, what you talk about in that book, in the Aftershocks, uh, and, and some things for businesses to consider? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the most interesting things is at the beginning of the book, we set out four scenarios for how things could play out based on how the pandemic plays out yeah. and how the economic recovery plays out. And I'm just putting up the screen again so everyone can see the, the beautiful cover that you've designed. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we have four, four possibilities. The first one we're calling the long goodbye, which is where you have the pandemic not coming under control for a couple of years mm -hmm. and a deep and prolonged recession. Right. There's a second right. one, um, which we call safe but hungry, yeah. where we get the pandemic under control, 
but we still have a long recession. The third, we're calling the VIP economy, where the pandemic isn't under control, but we start to get the economy moving. And the fourth, we're calling inclusive abundance, where we get the pandemic under control and we get the economy moving. What's really interesting is how many people think we're going to be in that first scenario, the long goodbye, but how few people are preparing for it. Uh, we're, we're natural optimists in society. We like to focus on growth and winning but actually i think right now the most important thing is to make sure we're thinking about all four different possibilities and what we would do to win under different circumstances what would we do we kind of know what we do if the economy is growing that's the easy one you know because we can revert back to some of the stuff we used to do and we can look for new opportunities it's the two where the economy is is shrinking or there's a downturn that lasts longer those are the ones we really need to put some effort into to say what can we do to still win in those scenarios? And there's lots we can do. And I counted it and across the 28 chapters, it's something like 300 different ideas of things that are going to be changing, opportunities that are going to be emerging that we can tap into. So there's got to be something in there for everyone. And if people go to your website and just mention my name, will they, can they get a discount? Yeah, I think if, if you want, and I will, we'll do even better for you, Rich. Um, uh, did we give you a discount code for the book? No, we need one. So if we can get that before we go live, we'll make sure it's in the description area. Okay. Yeah. So there'll be a code, which is RA30, okay. and your, your network can get a 30% discount oh, on, wow. in, in our store. Yeah. And if they, go, if they want the newsletter, uh, it's normally $149. Because you're a friend, they can have it for free if they use coupon code RT news when they check out RT news yeah Rotawa news yeah. okay and the other one was RA30 yeah as in reg out 1230 there you go we appreciate that right so yeah. it, it, as we come to an end I really appreciate your time I know you're a busy man you're doing a lot of virtual uh, sort of webinars and speeches right now so how how's the world change in your industry and how you're engaging with clients right now well, you know, I mean, literally our order book was wiped out <laughs> because we, you know, February, we were supposed to be all over the world. Uh, and in February, things started to be cancelled in Asia. Uh, so we've had to, to refocus. We put a lot of focus on the book. We, you know, we put this book together in nine weeks. Uh, we've got three more, sorry, two more titles coming out this year. Um, and uh, we put a lot of focus now on creating webinars building up events. We have 500 plus coming to our webinars, uh, finding sponsors for those, charging for some of the webinars we do, and then creating new offerings that clients want online. And the biggest one uh, we see is, yes, people want presentations, but now they really want to engage online. So you might do 20 minutes of presentation and two hours of just taking questions from everyone in the room. Uh, and moving from that design a complex workshop for us for a day mm. to give us 20 minutes of input and then everyone will come with their issues and we just want you to reflect on those and have conversations with us and a lot of boardroom briefings a lot of just join our board meeting or our executive team meeting shut up for most of it and every now and then put your hand up when you've got something to say that you think could really help us unstick a problem well, that's probably the area which we're, with our workload with clients probably dominates right now. So it's a combination of a lot of virtual board meetings, facilitating XCOM meetings. And then the, the area with a few clients every week is, is running uh, regular in, internal webinars for the organization. So not public, you know, very private, internal with groups of anything from 25 to 200 people. Uh, a bit like what you said, focusing on 20 to 30 minute segments and then using the Q&A in the chat and interacting with everyone and then giving another snippet of, 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 of information and going again. And we find those over an hour and a half add tremendous value to, to organizations and various topics could be, could be used, whether it's a sales focus session or a leadership session. You know, in your case, we'll definitely see how we can invite you in for a futuristic type session. Yeah, and what we're seeing is you're having to learn different ways of delivering. Mm. That what you could do with people in a half day or a day in a physical setting 
people don't want to sit through half a day or a full day online. So you have to pace it differently. You have to, as you say, balance a bit of content with a slower pace piece and then a faster pace piece and, you know, find ways of having different conversations. You have to find ways of replacing the rituals that you would have in meetings like handshake. You know, you can't do that virtually, but you have to recreate that. Yes, and, yes. and you have to put a lot of effort into bringing design thinking principles into those meetings so you can make the hour or the hour and a half really productive. So it's not I've just... I've never done a virtual high five. How does that work? Is that, can you see the screen? Yeah, you that... know, I've got one there. I'm, there I'm oh, yeah, yeah. There <laughs> <laughs> so that you know that could be that could be a you know different way of uh, uh, could, what's the biggest learning you have? what's the top two or three things you've gone through when it comes to adjusting from you know live face to face to virtual where it's been a huge learning curve for you but now you've got to a point where it's become a habit you're quite happy with it, it it's working well so uh yeah the top two or three things one is people are pretty forgiving so if the tech doesn't quite work if you know, if one of the speakers spends the whole time looking at the other speakers rather than at the camera, yes, you know, they're looking down all the time. People are forgiving of that stuff. Um, I had an interview yesterday when, you know, someone overseas and then the maid walked in and then uh, one of the kids walked in. It, it, it's okay, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, it, that's, all, that's all part of like life. So people are very tolerant of, of that stuff. I think... Um, People are finding great ways of being heard. Uh, one of the things I found really refreshing is the number of tools that are emerging to have good dialogue. So when you've got people in a physical workshop, you can use hundreds of different processes to get ideas out, make sure everyone's voice is heard. It's a little harder to do that, you know, in, when you've got 300 people on a webinar inside a company or, or 50 even. So now there's some really good tools emerging where you can get everyone's ideas out, share, vote on them, and everyone feels like they've been heard and they, they've been seen and, and their voice has been heard. So I think that's really important because it builds engagement. Could you, could and, you tell and, us about some of those tools? What, what are some of these tools that you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, so um, there's a whole field now emerging called collective intelligence. And I'll send you a link sure. to go look at some of those tools so you can choose the ones you want. But things like, you know, ones like Remesh, and there's a lot of different ones where they're using AI in the background, but they're, they're about building dialogue, appreciating different perspectives, uh, and really good ideas about how you design learning experiences and dialogue experiences online so that you move things forward faster. Mm. And, um, and then the third thing is, is not to forget to have fun. That... People do laugh, they, they, you know, a lot of cultures I work with, you know, unless you're laughing, unless there's a kind of sense of joy and pleasure in what we're doing, it can get very heavy. So finding ways of, of keeping it light, you know, a friend of mine I was talking to yesterday, she breaks her workshops uh, and she sends people to read something for 10 minutes and then sends them out to walk and talk to one other person on the phone about what they've just read so that they can just have a chat and and you know it's about finding ways of bringing freshness and uh vibrancy to the experience so that you're not just forcing people to look at a screen all day long because people's heads fry yeah um, well i think i've gone partially blind in the last two months with the amount of screen time and lights and everything so it's it's quite interesting on the other the other side of health and what impact it's going to have on people back pains sitting down for too long in a chair you know there's all sorts of things here i'd say the thing i've spent most time on is adjusting the lighting yeah. so that it's bright on my face but not blinding my eyes you know and i spend more time with all the lights in the room and the lights around you know to say how do you get that right so it feels natural but you're not crying because you're being blinded. Yeah, well, it's either that or, or my, my father gave me one of these uh, recently and he said, look, if you wear these, this will help you. And that, that actually is quite soothing. It's, uh, you know, there's, there's these all sorts of <laughs> different glasses coming out now. And these are the not only, sunglasses. These are, these are quite cool. But, the only thing yeah. is you can see the reflection of the screen on there the glass. Yeah. Well, we, we, it's a learning opportunity. You know, these things have been around for 10 years, but I think... Uh, the technology has become better, you know, bandwidth, internet connections, Absolutely. the actual software allowing us to do this successfully, but it's still a learning curve for a lot of people. Uh, I just remember two months ago inviting 
you know, people to Zoom meetings and webinars and people do, had no clue of what this technology was. Yeah, no, I think we've, we've all learned to become masters of how to fix things. That's the, actually, I think that that's one of the things that I'm most encouraged by is people's digital literacy has risen really quite quickly. Mm. Like I knew nothing about setting up Zoom webinars before we started. But now in between, you know, three Zoom calls, I can go in and learn a function in Zoom in five minutes. You know, how do I do X? How do I do Y? How do I readmit a participant that, you know, accidentally got kicked out? Or, you know, how do I do live polling? How do I do this? How do I do that? And, and it's great because I think we're all learning really fast. It's good. So is there anything that scares you about the future, right? You know, you've given us the shocks, but you've also been optimistic when you've told us about opportunities. But is there anything that, that scares you? Is there, is there the other side, the flip side, a bit of fear of anything regarding the future? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the scary thing is uh, if we end up with governments that aren't truly listening to their people and truly responsive. So right now you see what's going on in the States, 160 plus countries, people rioting, or not, not rioting, but protesting about the Black Lives Matter thing. And, and in some countries, you know, it's been dealt with very well. In other countries, you can see that the itching to just send the forces onto the streets and repress the population. And I worry that in order to control things, we might end up with some slightly repressive regimes in the next few years. Mm. And, and I, I just think that would be bad for humanity. And, and the, the other thing that worries me is the tension between nations. Mm. That if you have leaders who are kind of quick to, to go to military, we could end up with some conflicts that we really don't want or need rather than using dialogue as a way of solving those problems. And, uh, but then, you know, we also have a new cadre of leaders emerging around the world who, who seem much more dialogue driven, so much more driven by humanity. You know, you think about the prime minister of New Zealand, of Finland, of Iceland, you know, there's a group of them, quite a lot of them are women, but you know, they're coming through, and they just seem a little bit more reasonable, a little bit more human, a little bit more capable of seeing everyone's perspective. And I think the more we get of that, the more we're going to get good dialogue and, and sensible ways through these big global crises. And, the, and then the big one, I guess, is, you know, we have to have the big powers come together to solve the pandemic. Now, we solved the global financial crisis by the G7, the G20, and China working together to prevent an economic meltdown. We need exactly the same. Mm. You know, not just the World Health Organization, the UN, and the IMF, and the World Bank, but European Union, G7, G20, Organization of African Union, uh, you know, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, ASEAN states, the GCC states. They need to work together and say, how do we create a global solution that really rebuilds health infrastructure or builds health infrastructure in these countries, builds civil society infrastructure, strengthens education, strengthens governance, starts to encourage entrepreneurship and sees this as like a 10 to 30 year Marshall Plan like we had after World War II to rebuild Europe. We need that for about 50 countries in the world that are on the edge or are going to fall over. And if they fall over, it, it damages everyone. So. The real hope is that we take a very human approach to solving this crisis on a global basis. Which is going to require a lot of unity and uh, the reverse on, on, a, on a deeper level, you know, as human beings, we, I think there's a shift going on, isn't there? There's a, almost an evolution going on where, you know, most, most of these things have come from power, from greed, from ego, you know, lots of things going on in different parts of the world and that needs a shakeup. Um, I mean, just to give an example, just the other day, I had an interview with a fantastic entrepreneur from Africa. Uh, she was in the Forbes Africa 30 under 30. She's been on Oprah's list, you know, fantastic. Uh, and for those of you, if you get a chance on the channel, go and watch that episode, because we were talking about the Fortune 500, the Fortune 500 CEOs, only 37 are women. Right. And out of the 37 women, there is no women of color. Okay, and I was talking to Rapalang Rabana, coming from Africa, there is no black woman out of those 37. So, it, you know, we were just debating that road about the future of not just what's going on around the world right now, 
for, for people of color, you know, especially from South America, from Africa, Middle East, and Asia, being in these senior positions, but more importantly for females. So I, I feel there's a rise going on of really women leadership, females in senior roles, and the more of them that end up in these senior roles as prime ministers, presidents, I think that's going to shift the world. You know, women have the sixth sense. They have a different view. They have more empathy. They have a different way of operating. I, yeah, and I completely agree. The, the, the two things that have moved me most in lockdown, uh, and they both happened in the last week. One was a mother and her daughter. They were, it was on t a TV news thing. Uh, they'd gone to uh, Missouri where George Floyd had been murdered. Mm -hmm. And they were asking them why they were there. They were, they were white. And the woman said, we've come to listen. Mm. You know, in the past, I think there's this, been this tendency with whether it's developing nations or, you know, people who have been marginalized in society, haven't been included. There's been a tendency for those with power and privilege to go and tell them how we're going to fix you, right? As though we know your problems better than you do. Yeah. Now there's this, this subtle shift that's coming that's saying, no, in order to help deal with your issues, what we're going to come and do is listen and listen to what you want and need and how we make it more inclusive for you. And the other was, you know, possibly the most powerful speech I've heard in 10 years was the Reverend Al Sharpton speaking at George Floyd's memorial. Uh, I think it was on Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, really moving, really powerfully, you know, constructed, great orator. But he had this recurring message, which all great speeches have, which is, get your knee off our neck. And he kept saying it. You know, he was saying, we're just as good as you in the classroom, but we're not allowed to, you know, to succeed. Get your knee off our neck. We're just as good at creativity. We're just as good at, you know, coming up with ideas for governance, for, you know, leading corporations. But each time the message was, get your knee off our neck. And I think that's going to be the thing that knee isn't necessarily a physical thing it's a it's quite often yeah. a conversation also, you know, those, the famous words i can't breathe i mean that i think in yeah. its own right is is created a movement I think, i'm sure there'll be some documentary or a film or a book with that head you know that title has has captured everyone um so right i mean we could talk about this uh for for hours i think uh, for those for the viewers who've stuck around till the end congratulations I hope you've enjoyed it. Please, you know, go, go below, hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, subscribe to the channel, leave your comments, get a hold of Roy through his uh, social media and website as well. So Roy, are you looking forward to jumping on a, on a plane and traveling again? Yes and no. I mean, I miss, I miss the kind of getting to places, meeting people, uh, you know, learning about new cultures. I thrive on that. I've, you know, been to 70 plus countries, you know, 2000 speeches or whatever. Uh, and I love that. I love hearing how people see the world from wherever they are. The bit I'm not so keen on is having to navigate through airports and, you know, wondering about are people carriers or have they been vaccinated? And, and I want those processes to be really clear and really safe. And then I'm just not sure about sitting on a plane next to other people. I get that the air filters, the HEPA filters are as clean as is in an ICU unit and the, the air is recycled faster. So I get that from a science perspective. But I just wonder about sitting next to someone, you know, if they've got a cough or whatever, you know, what happens? Yeah. So it's, there is a level of nervousness, you know, about, um, about that. But I, you know, I've actually really enjoyed the lockdown from a point of self-care from a point of the creative flow we've been in and um you know the the, the time to kind of do self-reflection but yeah i want to get out and meet people now i want to go out and have fun um and well, it has to happen you know i think at some point and we are human beings we want to as i was talking to to someone yesterday about this you want to be able to go cheers or have lunch together dinner be in a social environment with people there's only so far you can go virtually and uh, I'm sure the whole conferencing and events industry will be flowing again next year and there'll be hybrid models with people who don't want to travel and, and will be online watching but I think you know I really appreciate your thoughts and keep up the great work that you're doing I think you're, you're building a phenomenal business with Fast Future 
uh, fast being key there with the, the amount of publishing work that you're doing right now. It's amazing in such a short space of time how you're publishing great work. I appreciate your time today, Rohit, and no, hopefully we'll do it Thank you. Again, maybe later on in the year, and we'll, we'll, we'll watch some of this video and uh, look back. That'll be great, yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for offering to do this and uh, you know, jumping in to be the first to do a, a full-length interview after the launch of the book. I appreciate that. Thank Thanks, Rohit. All right, well, you look after, you say, after yourself and stay safe, and we'll catch up soon. Thanks, Rohit. You too. Thank you. Bye for now, everyone.